1876, Los Angeles became the end of the line of the Transcontinental Railroad. Thousands of men, many displaced veterans of the Civil War, began to ride the rails, stowing away in empty boxcars and jumping trains. These hobos survived by handouts from religious and charitable organizations. The place where they congregated was called Hobo Corner. At the turn of the century, first in Los Angeles streets was legendary. It was one of the toughest hangouts in the West. It became invested with alcoholics, mental illness, and violence. Society deemed these people scum and dirty pigs. The Union Rescue Mission and the Salvation Army were all located there until they tore it down to build a city hall. During the Depression in the 1930s, many farmers and workers left their families seeking work in Los Angeles. Many became alcoholics ending up there. The social services began to evolve into social centers. During World War II and Vietnam, a lot of servicemen ended up there because it became their havens during their journeys. Most were addicts from PTSD, and Skid Row was a place to get their drugs and alcohol, as well as escape rejection. From the 1960s to the 1970s, 22,750 hotel rooms were closed down because they did not meet fire and safety codes. In 1975, the city put all their money into redeveloping this area. Because of this, surrounding communities were underfunded and sent their homeless to Skid Row. In the late 1970s, the EPA started closing down polluting factories. And with that, so went a lot of unskilled jobs. In Los Angeles County, Fire Station 9, which covers Skid Row, is the busiest firehouse in America, responding to 35,518 calls for service last year. There are over 2,500 nomads living on the street there. The term Skid Row derives from Seattle, Washington, where Skid Roads were the places where loggers slid their cut lumber to the ports for shipment. By the 1930s, the term referred to rundown areas of cities, characterized by bars, brothels, and the like originally attracted by loggers and began to include the presence of homeless and other extremely low-income populations. My name is Kevin Davis. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. When I was five, I would go to church and learn the song called Jesus Loves the Little Children. The song talked about how Jesus loved all kids of all races. Then I would go into a mall down the street and I'd see a separate water fountain for blacks only. I was pretty confused. When I was six, I was sent away to live with my grandparents in a small farming community in Nebraska. There were no minorities there. When I was nine, my mom remarried and I moved back with my family to Southgate, California. Our new stepfather was a racist and a bigot. My mom was the complete opposite. We lived on Alameda Street. On the other side of the tracks was Watts. When I was 12, we moved a few blocks away to a neighborhood that was infested with drugs. And of course, this influenced me. I was the only Boy Scout in my neighborhood and almost an Eagle Scout. There were no blacks in grammar school. I was the president of the school when I was in sixth grade. When I got to junior high and high school, there was a third black, a third Hispanic, and a third white. For the most part, these groups remained separated. I went to college to study theater. I found this as a group of misfits and people that didn't belong. I studied lighting and scenery design. In 1983, I lived downtown LA for several months. The homeless population wasn't that bad and we had many homeless friends. In 1984, I started my first scenery and special effects shop. In four years, it grew to be one of the largest on the West Coast. Because I had so much business, I was working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To make this happen, I used cocaine. Had I continued at that pace, I would have died of a heart attack. I stopped doing cocaine and then started a smaller shop downtown LA. One of my clients was working for the Super Bowl in Pasadena, and the NFL said we had to have a minority crew to be able to work on the job. I then put together a group of homeless workers and trained them. Most of them were black. To this day, this was the best crew I ever had. There were homeless people living behind my shop that would guard my shop at night. For a brief period of my career, I was the only white person that was working for BET, Black Entertainment Television. I was an art director and donated my time for such causes as Coalition for a Free Africa, produced by Dick Griffey. In 1992, after the Rodney King riots, there was a movement to come up with an idea how to rebuild LA. My friend John Marshall and a few other black leaders came up with an idea to build a film school near USC for minorities. This became such a great idea that Bryce President Gore was going to take a bus tour through South LA with John as well as a few prominent black figures. And then Maxine Waters claimed it was her idea. She parked a lady answering a phone in an office. The White House, seeing this turmoil, abandoned the idea and gave the money to the Missouri flood victims. In 1996, the director of the CIA came to a high school in L.A. for a town meeting hall. 
At that meeting, Michael Rupert, an ex-LAPD narcotics officer, confronted Don Jush and told him he had seen the CIA's involvement in drug dealing in South L.A. They were bringing crack cocaine into South L.A. and selling it at dirt cheap prices. Gary Webb picked up on the story and wrote about it in the Mercury News. Then Maxine Waters took the story to Congress. For Gary's involvement, he was whacked in late 2004. In 2006, Michael moved to Venezuela, fearing for his life. He, he then came back several years before they, they took his life. He told everyone he was with a friend in Colorado, but he was secretly living with a friend in Calistoga, California. I was friends with Michael about a year before he took his life. He was pissed that Maxine Waters had taken his story to Congress and left him and Gary out to dry. He'd been stripped of all of his benefits from the LAPD and was living on charity of friends. He was afraid for his friend's life. Three days before he shot himself in the head, he told all of us what he was going to do. Not one of us tried to stop him. On April 13, 2014, Michael did the decent thing. In early 2001, my girlfriend produced a radio show for Ted Hayes, the downtown L.A. homeless activist, who built the Dome Village. The Dome Village consisted of 20 fiberglass domes where families could live. The money was donated by Arco. The radio show he did in Pasadena was very late at night. Only a few people from Dome Village would call in. I sat in the booth next to him and called in disguised my voice in different accents. I asked vague questions so Ted could explain what was going on. At the time, Ted lived in Hollywood and had several girlfriends. His problem was that he was a Republican and thought George Bush Jr. would help him out. Ted told me that there was 12 NGOs that were downtown LA to help and none of them were doing anything. In 2006, the property they were renting increased by 700%. LA had a chance to fight homelessness but sold out to developers who made million dollar lofts. In 2002, I met a teacher of spiritual teachers like Deepak Chopra and Michael Beckworth. Her name was Pamelia Evans. She used the term divine nomad to describe the homeless, and it stuck. In 2009, I went to the Amazon to help restore it and save lives. I cleaned a major stream in the city of Pacalpa and pulled out 3,700 bags of trash. I fed nearly 1,200 kids and took over 100 to hospitals. I had a massive plan that I put together to save the Amazon, and in 2015, I had a brain aneurysm. While I was doing this, people kept asking me why I wasn't helping my own. When I first started going there, homelessness wasn't a big of an issue. Now it is. Last August, I started DNA, Divine Nomad Agenda, on Facebook. It had three major goals, which you'll see in the video. I first started a three blanket and no bed program. No LA City High School would get involved because of the politics. A week after I made the video promoting the idea, I found a gentleman out of Detroit who was, who was doing something similar. He'd been giving away backpacks since 2013 and now is in four different cities, Detroit, San Jose, New York City, and Washington, D.C. He convinced me not to become an NGO. He said that it was costly, and you become involved in competition against other NGOs. Then I started making what I call a thousand nomad city. These are cities that hold up to 3,000 nomads. They provide job training, and after five years, I plan to eradicate 80% of the homeless. These cities are food and energy farms. After the nomads are put back into society, they could turn into hostels and places to live when disasters strike. I'm about four to five weeks away from pitching this to the White House. I have a massive AutoCAD drawing and over 450 pages describing each entity and the costs. The plan is to put at least one of these in the 100 most populated cities in America. I have people in the UK interested in this project. At the beginning of the year, President Trump announced he had a homeless czar named Robert Marbot. He, like myself, believes that housing first is a mistake. It aims to get people a reliable home without focusing on services such as rehabilitation, treatment, or finding a job. Where we disagree is that I think homelessness is a national emergency and should be taken away from other cities and states that are lining their pockets. In the first week of March, I had a friend that was stuck in Singapore because of the virus. The Chinese were giving their citizens Yu Ping Feng Wan to prevent it. I started buying bottles of it, and together with my friend Bill, we started giving them away in LA Skid Row. We also gave away socks and water. We then went back the following weekend on March 14th. This time we brought more of everything. Then our mayor announced that anyone caught on the streets would be fined $1,000. He even offered a $200 snitch reward. About a month later, on April 19th, I went on my own because I didn't want Bill to get in trouble. I saw no cops on the street. I just saw people in need. People had caught on to the Yu Ping Feng Wan. Not only did the price go up, but so did availability. I only handed out socks. 
At the beginning of the virus, I stocked up on three different types of beans. One of them was white navy beans, which are super alkaline. As I was shopping for socks and water at Costco, I noticed they had a healthy tortilla made by a Las Tortilla factory out of Santa Rosa, California. The next weekend on April 25th, I took Bill. We handed out 60 burritos, 80 waters, and 104 pairs of socks. The next weekend on May 10th, we increased to 120 burritos, 200 pairs of socks, and 200 waters. We were starting to notice a crowd change as Bill had some lady yelling in his ear. On the 16th of May, we went back. We handed out 144 pairs of socks, 200 waters, 144 chocolate chip cookies, and 100 burritos. We had a case of water stolen out of our trunk. We could now see the crowd was different. A few days later, I watched a podcast with Joe Rogan and Dr. Rhonda Patrick. She was talking about how the sun can get rid of your virus. She said that for black people, they need more sun because the pigment is darker. This prompted me to buy enough capsules to give 200 nomads four capsules each. The plan was to take one every other day. I put them in a bag and stapled them to what I call thank you. 90% of nomads in Skid Row are black, so this is pretty important. On the 24th of May, things were much different. We went in with 165 burrito, 200 waters, 200 pairs of socks, and 200 doses of vitamin D. We got mobbed in front of the mission. They ran out of food and we were all there was. It was like a zombie movie with arms grabbing at Bill in the back seat. There was one guy who kept screaming at me because I wouldn't serve him. I was only serving women and he didn't want to wait on the men's line. It was now clear that the effects of the state releasing the prisoners had hit Skid Row.